from Chikileza We Science. Uh, my name is Stephen Ash Ashworth with a PH from Stephen because I'm a chemist and I'm here to show, do some live demonstrations uh, to see it. the sorts of chemistry that you could do at home and to investigate the sorts of things that we might think about as chemists. Now, in your home, you might be used to doing chemistry, uh, but you call it cooking. And when you do your cooking, you generally put on some protective uh, wear. And I have some protective wear. This is my apron. And I know at least one of the audience has a kitchen chemistry apron on this evening. Standing up just now, here we go, kitchen chemistry. So you would, I'm putting on the equivalent of my apron and you might in the kitchen wear some sort of gloves. Now, the point is here, I have looked at everything I'm going to touch and I've decided that I'm, I don't need gloves that I would normally use in the chemistry laboratory. But there is something that you don't tend to use in the kitchen that you, it's a good idea to use in the laboratory when you use chemicals, and that's safety. So now we're ready to do some chemistry. Now the thing is, the molecules that make up chemicals are all very, very small. They're so small, in fact, that if you took a bottle like this, this is a, a normal soda bottle, and you had enough of these to take all the water from all the oceans in all the world. Imagine you had that many bottles. So you filled everything up. You, know, you filled all these bottles up, empty all the oceans in all the, in all the world. The number of bottles you have would not be as many as the number of water molecules in one of those bottles. That says to me that these are really, 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 really tiny. These are tiny, but they take up some size. They, they have, take up some space. They have size and they have a shape. And one way of showing this is to take a piece of newspaper. Now, um, newspaper, the main newspaper, we take some wood, we mash it up small, and we make some fibers. Those fibers are made out of molecules that go into wood. And when paper is made, those fibers get brushed in one direction. Just like I brush my lovely long hair every morning. They get brushed in one direction. And if we tear along that direction, let's see what we get. We can see, I hope, I stand here maybe, we can see that that's a nice, clean, great tear. Okay, that tear is nice and clean and straight. And that's because I'm, I'm tearing along the fibers that go in this direction. Let's try tearing in the opposite direction. Now we're trying to tear across those fibers and we get a very different sort of tear. So that tells us that the material that we are using, those molecules to make up our materials, are giving us properties of change. Um, sorry, sorry, Steve, to, to, to interrupt, but there is yeah. some, some kind of interference with your microphone, and uh, ah. you, you're coming down as, as very dim. I'm coming down as very dim. But so not dim, dim, uh, but uh, so it's some, some scraping background noise. I don't know what it is. I'm scraping background noise. Let's do this. Ah, so there's a there's a there's a suggestion from uh, from Hilton that uh, your lab coat could be brushing, but uh, yeah, I've just moved the mic. No, it's still it's still as if somebody is scraping or something like this. No, there's nothing being picked up on the microphone except when I'm talking. So is it coming? No, it's up? fine. Fine now? Yes. 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 Okay. 
Now it's back again. I think your lab coat is 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 is, is uh, interfering or something like this. It picks up your lab coat. <laughs> well, I'm not taking off my lab coat. No, I know. <laughs> try and put it on the lab coat. That's any better. Move now. Is that any better? No, it's worse. It's worse. It's worse. So, guys, where can you, where's a good place to stick my mic? Do I have a loose connection? Right, so it's to do with the stream. Yeah. Okay, we've. That is fine. You see, this proves that it's really live. That it's really live. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're just checking the stream settings. I talk, I'm not going into the red. Is it, is it still coming? I'm still getting interference. No interference, just move, uh, move so that you can see. Now, as soon as you move, there's this background noise. Oh, okay. I'll just have to stand still then. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. But it's hard to do anything if I'm not moving. Yeah, no. <laughs> No, okay, no. continue. We'll 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 make a plan. You'll make a plan. Well, I'm 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 awfully sorry about that. Um, I'll, I'll try to stay as still as possible uh, in the bounds of actually doing the demonstration. Okay. So we got to molecules being small, but they have a size and a shape, so they take up some space in the world. Um, and so we can make molecules take up more space in the world if we heat them up, we give them some energy. It's like giving a load of children uh, Red Bull and sugar and caffeine and things. We can give uh, molecules more uh, energy. And what I've got here is some molecules with energy. I've got uh, this in the kettle that I've just boiled. You'll have to take my word that this is warm water. And here I have some water that is cold. Uh, that's been standing here, uh, room temperature, which room temperature here in the UK is somewhat lower than room temperature in South Africa at the moment, I believe. And what I'm going to do is just put some color in those glasses so that you can see the water that is hot. Now, the idea here is to show that the hot water takes up more space than the cold water. And if, it, if we have the same glass full, but the water is taking up more space, then I've got managed to squeeze less water into that glass. It's actually less dense. And so all I have to do now to show you that it's less dense, to show you that the hot water will float on the cold water, is to take this glass, and turn it upside down and put it on that. Now, I've practiced for years to do this because uh, the first time I did it, uh, it wasn't very successful, and we're still cleaning the food dye off the ceiling in our kitchen. And of course, I've got to get it exactly right because otherwise it just won't work. So I'm going to cheat. Uh, I have here some CDs and they're this with a, a hole in the middle. And you can see, I hope that I can get my finger through the hole. And if I line two of those up like that, both like that, there you can see the hole. And if I offset them, there's just enough to form a seal to allow me to sit the glass upside down like that and slide that over. And what we see is the red hot water generally stays at the top. And the water that's not red 
is the bottom. Now, of course, some of you, I hope, are thinking to yourselves, well, that would have happened anyway. Good critical scientists. So I have another pair of CDs. These are slightly worse for wear. They don't have any covering uh, printing on them anymore. And what I'm going to do is do that the other way around. So I'm going to take the cold water and put it on the hot. And now we see that the cold water is indeed more dense than the hot water. And we see that the cold water is descending into the lower glass and the hot water is rising into the upper glass. I don't know whether I can come closer. Maybe we can focus on that to show the process going on. Wonderful. You can see it's just like smoke coming up from the chimney. That hot water is rising into the upper glass but the, and the cold water is descending into the lower glass. So now if you leave the focus just like that for the moment, I'll fetch the other two. On the, on the other hand here, we have a situation where the hot water is staying suddenly at the top and the cold water is staying suddenly at the bottom. And that should maintain that for the rest of the show as long as I manage not to tip them over. Now, when I was young, I used to think that chemistry was magic. And I've been practicing a magic trick. Um, and it's been fairly successful because I have no audience. Well, at least no audience now. You see, as far as I'm concerned, they disappear. So what I'm going to what I would like to have done if I had an audience is take an audience member and put them here and then do the magic pass and maybe just sit in a puff of smoke. And then a little while later, I could come over here and I would wave my hands and they would reappear in a suitable pot of smoke. Now I've been practicing this and so far, I have not managed to get anyone back, at least not on injured. So what I'm going to do is show you how I started practicing with the baby steps you take to start with. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take some uh, material here. This is salt, a well-known brand. Other brands are available. And if I put some on my hand, I hope you'll be able to see that, that is there is some salt there. Come a bit closer to the camera and you can see that there's some salt there. Um, I've got my stuff in my hand. And so now my task is to make this salt disappear. So watch it carefully. Still there at the moment. Watch carefully. Still there. And it's gone. That works a lot better usually with an audience. Uh, so what's happened? Well, obviously I've just dissolved the salt. The salt has disappeared. It's no longer visible because it's dissolved. And you say, well, we do this every day. And yes, indeed you do. But equally, I could get that salt back unharmed by just letting the water evaporate. And that's what I can show here. If you imagine that this is my water. So I've got some polystyrene beads in here, banded polystyrene beads. If you imagine that's my water, and I've got some polystyrene balls here. That's my salt. And now we've got the two mixed. They've, one's dissolved in the other. And all I'm going to do is, let me put it there. All I'm going to do is let the water evaporate like that. So the water <laughs> evaporates like that. And what we see at the end, uh, what we see at the end is the salt just left in the glass. Now water is very good 
at dissolving things. But there are other liquids that are also very good. One of them is acetone. And I have a bottle here, a tin here of acetone. And if I put a little in my glass here, what we can do is take this material and see what happens to it. Now acetone is something that might be familiar to some of you. It's the smell you get of a nail polish remover. And it's some nail polish removers will, will do that for you, but a lot of them nowadays have too much water put in. Now chemists, well, they, they like to play with lots of things. Um, one of the things they like to do is figure out what's in a, a material. And so one of the things you can use is an indicator. This, this is an indicator. This is just some tea that I've made. You could make this an indicator with um, red grape juice or cabbage water, red or otherwise. And what I'm going to do is just pop a little in some water and you can see that it's I hope you can see that color as a sort of red color. Now, what I see is that I've not prepared everything here. Uh, I'm missing one vital ingredient. I'm missing my base. Often find in the kitchen, we can add that and we see that the indicator has now turned back to well, it's, it's pink, it's very fizzy because of the base I used. It's turned a nice pink color, and that tells me that it's acid. Now, something we find in the, the baby section of pharmacies, certainly here in the UK, is milk of magnesia. Some of you may have used this. I drink it when I've had a little um, too much enjoyment uh, the night before. This is good to have with breakfast to help settle the stomach. And you can see why it's called milk of magnesia because it is indeed white. It's milky. It looks milky. And we can ask ourselves, is this an acid or is it a base? Which way do I need to hold it there? In front of the black. And so I add some indicator and that should tell me. Now, I can see this is a, a murky green that it's turned. And so that tells me that my milk of magnesia settles my stomach because it's, it's a base. So now my stomach is nicely settled and this is green. Actually, I'm going to come closer to the camera so we can see this better. And Tristan's going to focus for me. So you can see that's the sort of murky gray green. And if I add some vinegar, what you see is that now all oh, my stomach hurts again, because I've had another drink. And what's happened is that the vinegar has turned the solution acid. Now as I mix this up together, you might see that it, that acid color is fading. That's because the white of the milk of magnesia is because the milk of magnesia contains a solid. That acid is slowly dissolving some of the solid and perhaps you can see that color has turned back to green. And that will keep happening. I can keep having another drink or adding some acid that will keep happening until we reach the point where all that solid is dissolved. And then we end up with this sort of a, a, a solution that you can see through, that it's not milky anymore. 
Now, many of our indicators in, uh, in the kitchen are highly colored. So I said red grape juice, I said red cabbage water, or even just cabbage water, tea, the, all these sorts of things are highly colored, but there are indicators that are not highly colored. And here's one, I hope you can, again, I'm going to come, come closer. You can see that this is a gray white liquid. And all I've done here is I've cooked up some maizena in water. And this is an indicator that we can use to detect the presence of iodine. So actually I'll come back to you again, Tristan. What I'm, I'm just going to add a little indicator into that water. And here I have my iodine. So if we take the iodine and add it, You can see that it becomes a very dark, uh, it's actually a blue-black, it's described as a blue-black color. We can do some chemistry on that iodine by taking some vitamin C. Now vitamin C is good for you, it's, you learn it's an antioxidant. And we can use that property of it being an antioxidant to do something to the iodine. And if we do that to the iodine, then what's going to happen is it won't, it will no longer form this black color with our maizena and we'll see uh, another color change. So here I have some vitamin C, it's fizzy C, just dissolving in some water. So vitamin C tablets, I add that to the iodine and we see that the color we have left is the color of the vitamin C tablet and the color of the, the blue black color of the iodine has disappeared. I'm probably about halfway through my presentation now, which is when I generally like to have a drink. So I've got a bottle here, a bottle of water. Just to a, to give me a drink, and B, to show you that it is just water. But you may be sitting at home uh, as a chemist, you may be sitting at home and thinking, um, I wonder if a friend's going to call. And they do. I, I don't usually have that problem because um, they don't call on me. But what, uh, what you might find is that you have just water in the house and you'd really like to offer them something else. They come along and they say, oh, have you just got water in the house? Haven't you got anything like apple juice? So you say, okay, let, let's take my water and see if I can make some apple juice. Let's, let's see if we can do this close to the camera. So I've, I've got my, my water here and let's see if I can turn that into uh, some apple juice. So that's rather nice looking apple juice. And then uh, a second friend comes along. But the second friend is allergic to apple juice. And they say to you, uh, well, maybe, maybe you've got some Coca-Cola. And so you say, well, let's see if they take the apple juice, we might be able to turn it into Coca-Cola. And then finally, someone says, oh, I don't like apple juice. And I don't like Coca-Cola, what could I get instead? And you say, well, let's see what happens when I tip this into there and you can get some, um, oh, looks like white wine on that picture, at least. So chemistry is wonderful if you have friends around and you don't have any drinks in the house. Obviously, there, you wouldn't drink any of those that I've just made and the chemistry that is going on is the chemistry that I just showed you with the iodine and the vitamin C. So that is a, that's what we call a water into wine experiment. And that's the sort of experiment that you can make at home. Now, while chemists make new materials, they put things together lots of times, they also 
like to take things apart. So I'm going to have a go at taking some things apart now. What I've got here is some bicarbonate of soda. That's the sodium bicarbonate that you might find in, in a kitchen. And it turns out that if you have a carbonate material, any sort of carbonate, and you add an acid to it, you produce a gas, carbon dioxide. So we've got a solid here, we've got a liquid acid, and what I'm intending to do now is show you that that will produce carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a gas, so what we should see are some bubbles, and those are indeed bubbles. Right, now's the, now's the hard bit. What I want to show you is that those bubbles are carbon dioxide. So I have my beautiful assistant here, and that is a candle. And so my first, first thing I want to do is have my bubbles and pour a glass of carbon dioxide. Now, obviously that's not visible. It's an invisible gas. So I have no idea whether there's any in that glass at all. And we, I hope we can see the candle burning in the other glass. Can we, can we actually see that? Um, this might not work now. So we've got the candle. Oh, that's why it's, I'm holding it in the wrong place. Okay, we've got the candle. You can see the candle burning. And if we tip the carbon dioxide into the candle, we see it goes out. So what's happened there is carbon dioxide is denser than air. So carbon dioxide has filled this up and displaced the air, just like we saw over here with our cold water being denser than hot water, the carbon dioxide is denser than air. It's pushed the air out of this, and then I can pour it into here and it will settle to the bottom and push the air out again. And then when I take my candle and do it again, of course, the candle doesn't have any oxygen to burn, displace the air, and so that uh, goes out. Another thing we can take apart is this stuff. This is called hydrogen peroxide. I'm going to use a fresh bottle, I think. Where's my orange bucket. That's hydrogen peroxide. Now hydrogen peroxide is toxic, it's poisonous. So I have to be a little careful with it. The bad news is that you are making it in your body right now. You're making it just through breathing. Now, the last thing we want to do is this to build up in your body. So your body needs a mechanism to get rid of it. Just in case of mess. Your body needs a, a mechanism to get rid of it. And we have these things called enzymes in our bodies. Now our enzymes can take the hydrogen peroxide that I've put in here and they can turn that hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. What I'm going to do is add just a little bit of washing up liquid when it reaches the end of the bottle uh, to this. And what that's going to do is catch the bubbles for me. Ooh, nearly there. So there's some dish soap washing up liquid. And so if we create any bubbles of oxygen, we'll see them caught as a foam in there. Now, at this point, I could use some liver or I could use celery, but the most uh, convenient thing to use rather than blood or liver or celery or anything is actually yeast. So I've made up some yeast here. And if I put the yeast in my bottle, you can see, I hope, that we are producing lots of oxygen.
And that is what your enzymes are doing in your, probably in your liver and blood all the time to mop up that hydrogen peroxide that if it built up in your bodies, that it would uh, cause a problem. So I've only got a couple of things left to show you. Uh, what you didn't notice, but I did because I was holding the bottle, was that bottle got warm, which tells me that chemistry is somewhere that I can produce energy. And we, we rely on chemistry for energy in all sorts of different situations. And this is one of them. Uh, what I'm going to do now is try to make a model of an internal combustion engine, a car engine, if you like. So what's going to happen here? I've got some fuel, which is methylated spirits, just an alcohol. And I need to get the this to evaporate into my bottle. Now, if this were in South Africa, it wouldn't be a problem because it would be nice and warm. But in the UK today, it's not quite that warm. And so I'm going to have to cuddle my bottle to ensure that it's warm enough to get enough gas into the bottle to, uh, for this to work. Now, this is what happens in your normal internal combustion engine in a car. You produce a, a vapor of petrol and you mix it with air, so there's oxygen, and then you light it, and there's a controlled explosion. That's what happens in a car engine. Of course, soon I won't be able to say that, at least in the UK, because they're going to stop selling internal combustion engine driven cars. We're going over to electric cars. Uh, but for now, I can. Everyone knows what a car engine is like. So having cuddled my bottle for a little while. I hope I've got enough gas in here to show this. So I'm going to tip out the excess fuel because liquid fuel doesn't burn. It may surprise you to know that liquid fuel doesn't burn. It's only the vapor that burns. And when I've got rid of enough of that, I'm going to ask Tristan to dim the lights. But not just yet. So I need, okay, if you like to dim the lights. And now you need to watch carefully to see whether anything happens. Okay, we can have the lights up again. Uh, now that's the internal combustion engine, and we've created a lot of heat, you heard some sound there. And if we had time and patience, we could let this bottle cool down and we'd find that all the water that we produced in that was captured and would condense in there. Now, that's how we drive an internal combustion engine. And some of us rely on alcohols for some of our calories, but mostly we use food to drive our bodies. We need to produce energy from food. And, oh, it's caught there. And what I want to do now is try and extract some energy from food. I've left this till last because if I do this and the fire alarms go off, that all the students above us in the library will get tipped out. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, light my flamethrower. And then I'm going to take some Maisena. It's simply Maisena, although this isn't, this isn't what you'd recognize as Maisena, it's slight, some other brand. So what I'm going to do is try to extract the energy from that. Now, obviously no one eats pure Maisena. You're going to mix it with other things but this is the energy stored in that Maisena. <laughs> 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 so 
So that is what keeps us fueled. That's the sort of amount of energy we have, and that's the energy you need to run around outside, the energy you will use to keep fit, and the energy you will use to give a huge round of applause to a science show presenter halfway around the world. Thank you very much. Guys, if you want to unmute yourself and give Stephen a round of applause.